like one of the things I luckily got from one of my mentors is that you want to like when I was going to my master's degree I was doing my master's degree with the philosophy that I do the least amount of work as possible and I do it as focused as possible so that I have my time to do the things that I really am passionate about <laughs> like salsa and real estate at the time John Gray stuff all the personal development books that I was reading And now we are finding out in science also that actually the stress is more about our nervous system than that it is in the mind. The more intense, stressful life lifestyle you have, the more you have to pay attention also to the recovery side so that you can maintain the intensity or that you can continue having energy and you can continue to have a clarity of mind and focus and so on. So. I look him in eyes and say, I want to come to work for you. And then, and then he does his wizard thing. He just looks at me in the eyes and says, you have bright eyes. Keep that intention. But now we have more tools available for us. The cost of technology has gone down, so we have the ability now to bring these services more for normal people which usually it used to be only super top athletes that could use certain technology now it's become available for normal people to become you could become your own life superhero in, in many ways to do more to have more energy to enjoy more life this is sir for life and i am your host tommy today i'm sitting in the helsinki Salsa Academy and Biohacker Center with Mikko Kempe. You're a former basketball player. You started as a young kid and as 19 year old, you moved to the US and you played basketball for the University of Louisiana in Monroe, mm -hmm. where you studied also marriage and family therapy. Mm -hmm. During your stay in Louisiana, you started learning salsa and later you founded two salsa communities in Louisiana in mm -hmm. the US. After that you moved to San Francisco, you wanted to develop your skills as a salsa dancer and later you became the first male Latin ballroom dancer in Finland to rise directly to compete at the highest A class in senior level. Since then you've been a successful dancer and a judge in the international competitions. When you moved back to Finland in 2010, you founded this nice place here, Helsinki Salsa Academy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, pretty much, I suppose, you, s you founded as well the Biohacker Center here in Finland. Both of them were the first ones in Finland. Mm -hmm. Besides managing your multiple businesses and teaching and performing around the world, you are a marriage and a dating counselor as well. Mikko Kempe, <laughs> long list, well, future Siemens, you. welcome to Surfer of Life. Well, thank you, glad to be here. <laughs> Biohacker. And welcome to you, They're over here. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice place, very nice place. Um, Biohacker Center, I'm going to ask more about that later, but first question is that when did you do the, your last biohack and what was it? Ah, well, actually, maybe this tea could be called, we have this oh. kind of little elixir, we have different medicinal mushrooms, different little bit of fats so I have been uh, just fasting this morning and just using a little bit of fats and different medicinal mushrooms so a lot of people could call that a biohack that you start the morning with some kind of nice energy fast a little bit for your health so I think that could be the very last biohack yeah, glad you mentioned about it because I was just about to ask what are we drinking today well, <coughs> well there's a little bit of uh, food in chaga extract there's a little reishi extract then there's just a tiny bit of caffeine and then there is um, mct oil and a little bit of um, ghee which is like this kind of good type of fat also and then there is a little bit of chamomilla a little bit of cayenne pepper a little just a little pinch of honey a little salt and little licorice uh, root extract for a little bit of taste. Yeah, so it's a yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of a. I usually like to just experiment and try different tastes and try different things. So, 
So that's that's what's today. <laughs> okay, it, uh, it's interesting tasting and it's not bad at all to be honest. Uh, what is it doing to me actually? Well, I mean, I I'm not like uh, it's good to clarify right from the beginning that that I'm not like expert in many of these uh, fields that you could go into any of these. Biohacking is such a large umbrella term and it en- encompasses so many things. So. A lot of people say that Shaga, for example, a good friend of ours, uh, Jaakko Halmetto, had written a whole book, or David Wolf had written a book about Shaga. So a lot of people say that Shaga helps with your immune system. Uh, then Rishi is said to have relaxing uh, effects of your nervous system. And I, I personally kind of subjectively feel like, for example, if you, a lot of people try to drink coffee and it kind of puts your mind into this kind of very tunnel vision. But Rishi, to me, it, it's sort of like I get a sense that it allows me to be a little bit like focused, but in a kind of creative way. So it helps me like um, if I want to do some kind of creative work, I usually like to use Rishi. Rishi I like to use a lot. And then these are more, they call them adaptogens, like these medicinal mushrooms. So adaptogens means that it doesn't have this kind of a like a up and down effect that you might have with a caffeine, like this kind of stimulant that has a, like a peak, you get like a lot of brain power, but then you crash a little while after. Although if you combine it with fats, that's where the butter uh, uh, and the fat coffee kind of idea came where, you know, you try to elongate that effect. But the idea with adaptogens is that it gives you like a smooth, longer effect. So for example, those are Rishi and Shaka is uh, definitely two of my favorites. Maybe I should have started drinking it earlier because I was a bit struggling with the introduction here. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you would get me more focused and concentrated on here. We are all right here. Uh, but let's first travel a little bit back in time. Let's sure. start the little time machine here. And You were born and raised in Oulu, am I correct? Yes, uh, I was uh, in Turku and in Oulu. I was born in Oulu, then we moved to Turku. We were there for eight, nine years, and then we moved back to Oulu. So okay. I kind of consider myself being from Oulu. I was yeah. born there, and then we moved back, and I lived there for nine, ten years before moving to the US. You seem like a very sharp and focused person, and it <laughs> seems like you have this uh, great uh, self-confidence, and you achieved a lot in your life. What about you as a young kid? Were you like this at the beginning already, or can you remember things? Yeah, well, I think that's a, that's a great question. I don't... Um, as a young kid, I think I was just a. I consider myself just a regular kid, in a way that uh, that a lot of this came later in U.S. when I started to get into self development. But so, so when I was younger, yes, I think I was like extroverted. You know, I like to be with kids, and I think I, if I like analyze myself and my psychology in a way where all this came from, I remember like a couple of really fortunate events. Like one thing I think that why I have this kind of feeling that I can just go anywhere and, 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 and go to talk to people and if I uh, if I want to go into some group I, I don't feel I, I feel confidence and I remember when I was four or five years old and we had uh, moved in Turku from one one ta- one place to another and in that place it was this uh, apartment building complex and there was younger kids but they were all older like um, I was in just going into kindergarten, whereas those guys were already. Uh, one guy was on the first grade, two guys. One guy was on the third grade, one guy was on the fourth grade, and two guys were on the sixth grade. So you can imagine when you were like four, five, six, that's a big gap, you know. So some of those guys were already twelve. But the fortunate thing was when I remember they kind of took me as as a part of the, their gang in a way that they had lived there for years already. They had this kind of tight knit guy group that played together during the summers. And I remember like they, because looking back, what if they would have just said like, no, we won't, we don't want you in, in part of our, but like they took me as a like, you know, the favorite, you know, gang member as a kid. We, we went to a lot of different places, played soccer and, and went around. So I remember like looking back, like that was a really fortunate that it was, I was so lucky those guys really took me on. And I think, you know, that gave me a good head start in some ways and then but like in school I was not so interested in school at all I was more into sports and my dad was a marathon runner so that's another fortunate event you know my dad had this kind of like unbelievable belief in himself back in the day I think he won one Finnish um, championships and went to European championships and a marathon runner so he 
ran at a quite high level. And so uh, I saw him running as I was, you know, growing up. I remember sometimes seeing him like, you know, he, he, him coming from a run after winter and, you know, he's just all his cold head and face is just full of ice, icicles. So, but just seeing, looking at that as a kid, you know, you just think it's normal. It's your dad, you know. Yeah. And so I think I got a like um, interest in in into becoming into sports through that, and that when I later started playing basketball also was a big, big thing in developing my self esteem because actually in in some some sense uh, sometimes not much but sometimes you know I was bullied in school and you know I was not, I was shy in many ways I was not very extroverted talkative on the fifth, sixth, seventh grade and so forth. But but those kind of events, I think, has a lot of, uh, shape you a lot. And and then when I got to the US, I started really getting into personal development and that, then that took me on the whole other path. But before you do this, something happened during your 15s ah, that right. really changed your life permanently, I believe so. What was that? Tell me about that. Which which one? Ah. When I was... You were There's a couple of them. Yeah, yeah, a couple of ones. Uh, <laughs> the book is one, and the other one is maybe when you're going to meet this lay girl, probably. Ah, yeah. And after that, I, I read about it, so I would okay, like to wait, know more wait, about wait. it. Wait, wait, wait. So, uh, I, you mean... Uh, you, John okay, Gray, probably? John, well, John Gray yeah. I met when I was... Well, it was when I was... What about the book? Yeah, well, 19. Yeah, that's right, okay. Yeah. 19, I was, I, I was uh, dating with this girl for... Mm, two and a half years about we were a little bit on and off we had all kind of struggles and challenges toward the end of our relationship and then I got the scholarship to go play basketball and so uh, but at that moment you know I remember thinking like why is it so like why am I like why are we struggling why this is so hard you know and, and like why 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 I'm getting so frustrated with her and why we have such struggles and and so I was kind of open to new ideas to understand myself and relationships and luckily we went to, and found this book we were actually went together to this one antique store in Oulu right. and found it in Finnish uh, together forever men are from Mars women are from Venus it was in yeah. Finnish exactly. and I thought you know I don't really need relationships I just need to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there was this kind of typical male attitude about it that you know I already know everything but still I'm wondering why I'm not doing well and so anyway Going to US, literally flying to a new world, I was reading the book which opened my eyes and mind kind of to realize that shit, there's so much that I have no idea about the world. So that was the really first moment that really opened my eyes to understand how little I know about the world. Mm -hmm. And because that book really spoke to me and those, you know, examples that John explained in the book was so resonating exactly, it was kind of like he had been watching us. You know, like what had been going on and struggles and uh, mistakes that we had been making. So that opened my eyes and, you know, I was crying. And I was like first time understanding more about from her point of view, from my point of view, why it wasn't really neither one of our fault that we didn't understand what was going on. It's just that we didn't know any better. We were both like modeling our parents, uh, you know, sure. yeah. behaviors and the, the, the role models we got. And this is not to say that, of course, my parents have given me lots of good things, but also lots of things that could be improved. And so, so that opened my eyes to then realizing that, okay, I need to like, I got interested in relationship and that way from a lot of different subjects also. I said, I mentioned about the 15 year old when I was checking out your background and saw some writing about <laughs> your, uh, you and there was a mention about this situation that when you were just meeting this girl when uh -huh. you were like 14 or 15 and then yeah. you realized that you were not able to f do the things you wanted that then you started developing your idea about the relationship maybe i'm getting it wrong maybe yeah I'm, maybe I'm, it was uh, uh, it was yeah. uh, uh no it was not 19 when i read okay yeah. uh, when i was moving to us that's when i read yeah. the book yeah yeah All right. it was uh Maybe. Well, ah, you, okay, okay. You, 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 the first first example is that I sometimes give is that on the 15 when I was just first starting to date, yeah, and I give exactly. the example of like how lost I was, like the very first date. You know, this was actually not this girlfriend that I just described, but it was yeah, a, my kind of my kind of my first official date in a way. Like I was 14, 15, and I remember just like the way it happened was one of our mutual friends. You know, she had told him that. 
she would be interested in me and I got their phone number I, I called her and then I remember just riding my bike to this uh, corner of a store where we where we plan to meet and then at that time it really hit me that shit I have no idea <laughs> what I'm supposed to do we, I kind of like this I don't know what I'm supposed to do I call her I'll get with planned date now it's like what I'm supposed to do on the day I had no idea like what I'm supposed to say what are we supposed to do how how is it supposed to go the only kind of in Finland we have these role models called Uno Turhapuro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're like, should I should I apply those ideas? You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, or, or then the other movies we get is from US. You know, like we see some James Bond movies or we see we see yeah. some other movies, but those don't really apply, and you don't feel so sensitive. You know, you're just with a bicycle. You know, <laughs> then you yeah, take yeah. the lady. You don't have a, your dad's Cadillac, and you can't drive in Finland until you're 18, and you're just lost, you know, like, what, what are you supposed to do on a date? So, so I had no idea, <laughs> so that was my, like, beginning realization that we, we really are not taught on these kind of skills. A little trigger there. Okay, now we are, now we are in the airplane, you are flying the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you feel to go there? You were 19, you're not... Or give, you are a grown up, right? 18 yeah, to be yeah. an adult, but you are still very young. Yeah. And you're leaving home, you're leaving all, you're flying to the US. How did it make you feel? Were you yeah. scared at all? Well, yeah, I had actually gone to when I was 15 and 16. Uh, when I was 16, I, I think, around that time. I, I went one time. That was my first time going there. I went to this basketball camp. All right, yeah. And that's how like the coaches knew about me also and so forth. But it was still a big step going like completely moving to a new world. And I didn't know what to expect. So, yes, there was, I was afraid in some ways, but really excited on another level. You know, it was like going into a new world at the time when there was no YouTube or Skype or... You know, email yes, was working, but nobody was really using it that much. So it was a, uh, it was very exciting. It was an exciting time, and going to uh, play at a high level of basketball, which was my dream. That was also, uh, you know, scary in a sense that that the university I went to play, you know, that was really tough. Like one guy went to NBA when Michael Jordan was in Washington Wizards. He played in the same team. And so it was a tough level. So that was also um, very challenging and very growing. And but most thing, I think it was just exciting. I mean, what a, what a kind of like. I mean, now looking back, I imagine some guys who have been these adventurers going to some jungle, you know, back in when there's no communications and you might be lost there for a year. And so I, you, you, I, I relate that feeling to that. Like, wow, what a, but obviously may not be that amazing but it still was for me a big thing of course is it important to have these experiences younger that you go there by yourself and you have to kind of like figure it out and just to build up your self-confidence no i think for sure yeah absolutely like especially if it calls for you you know not necessarily for everybody necessarily Mm. like if they 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 like more more of a you know doesn't have to be for everybody but i think if if there is a part of you that wants to i mean uh, you should definitely go for your dreams like one of my good friend Tommy Kokko says this kind of like you have to chase your dreams here in Finnish a lot here in Finland a lot and yeah I, th- I think it can be um, super important experiences for your life and definitely was for me and so I have highly recommend everybody to, to sort of explore and, and do things and go out of their comfort zone and explore themselves and different adventures and experiences yeah. I agree on that <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> That you were a good basketball player. You told me that you went to play in a very high level in the university. How are you as a basketball player? How did you cope with the situation in the game? It's a tough situation. Let's say, let's start from the beginning, like before the game. Were you nervous before the game? Or yeah, I can, I can explain. In Finland, where I was comfortable, you know, when I was 15, I started playing in the men's team in Division mm. 1. And those were kind of uh, stepping stones that I was able to handle. But I have to say, like in the U.S., I was actually uh, I developed a little bit of like kind of panic. Uh, like I mean, I was highly stressed on those situations because because it was such a dream, and I wanted to stay in the U.S. I wanted to. My dream was to get a green card and stay in the U.S. You know, do this whole American dream thing. Nah. And so I was scared because uh, in the relatively to the other players in our team I was now when in Finland I used to be in like the top guy scoring the most points you know being in the Finnish championships in our our age you know I think I was like number two in scoring in the whole whole country or something like that 
and now going into this situation, which was a whole other ball game, and now we are talking about guys who are fighting for million dollar contracts, and the whole dynamics of the team is like, you know, this is a fight out there in the court. Everybody's like trying to step up on you, get a mental, you know, advantage on you. So it's not like you know everybody was just fr- friendly and <laughs> and friends necessarily, which you would sometimes imagine they could be, but. We had a really so it was a mentally tough, and so for me, I actually felt like I almost had to find these kind of personal development tools. So first was you know some of these John Gray's books like I mentioned, then was uh, books about meditation, Kundalini meditation. So I started meditating religiously for every morning, every uh, every night before I go to sleep. I started like. Uh, being religious about my schedule, I go five eight, five thirty. I wake up, I go, you know, train for an hour and a half before anybody. Then I meditate again for twenty minutes. Then I go to do my schoolwork if I have time during the day before or after our three and a half hour training. I meditate again for two hours or something. Then at night before I go to sleep, I meditate. And so I realized that for me, meditation became like this huge tool. To realize that no matter how stressful the outside world is, I can go to an inner place to find peace, and that was a huge like realization and insight for me. And I felt, of course, it's kind of like externally a put. Of course, I kind of I could have gone back to home and not deal with the pressure, and but I felt I wanted to stay there, and so I felt I had to find the tools to be able to cope with the with the pressures because to put things in context, context at that time, I think in '99, the Finnish national team is now doing really well. I mean, amazing. But back then, I heard that the Finnish national team, the men's best of the best, which I was not part of the Finnish national team, they went and played against the Division Two teams in the U.S. and got beaten. You know, so the the level, so the level, and I was not, I was not even playing in the Finnish Championship League. I was playing in D1 in the men's D1, and so the level difference for me to get there, it was like part luck, but good timing. Part hard work, part talent, of course, and but the level difference was was big, and so it was like a good good challenge for me to grow. What about the way with this <laughs> crazy weird Finnish guy, <laughs> European, who was meditating in the morning? What did the other guys think? Well, about I didn't guy? I didn't tell them that I'm meditating <laughs> in the morning. I, I mean, I was it was fun because um, I was in a whole other world. I my English skills was not that good yet, um, uh, so. There's a lot of pressure, of course, to you know to do the do the. I actually did the undergrad first in finance, then I did my master's in business, then I did my master's in marriage and family therapy. But uh, that was also challenging. So a lot of time I was just spending time alone and just doing my thing and reading. And the guys could have gone to the party, you know, maybe smoke some, maybe drink some, <laughs> and then I was riding my bicycle to go to books a million or a library to just read. So, right. so I went to a whole other path. That's interesting. <laughs> you were not bad player. You were an all star player at some point. I, well, yeah. I was uh, I was an academic all star. Academic. All-star, That's a different right? thing. Academic all star means that I had good grades. Okay. okay. <laughs> and so so there was a lot of lot, those guys who were a lot better players, but ne- not necessarily so good academically. Okay. <laughs> so in our Southland conference, I was an academic all star. Okay. <laughs> so so yeah. so that uh, that game gives me uh, so. It's not necessarily the best players. <laughs> but you were in the peak of your career as a basketball player, mm-hmm. but then something made you change the whole setup. You started learning salsa, you started dancing. Yeah. Why was that? Well, it was part of this meditation journey. I started re- reading about personal development books and you know, there's you're young and your mind is open and you start to actually apply these things. Like how many of the people actually read books these days but don't actually apply what the books Uh, suggesting so but when you're young and, and and you're there in a kind of time warp and you have the, all the time in the world so I started reading these books and actually applying like writing listing listing the goals and taking days just to think like what I really want and so that's part of it salsa became then I was thinking yeah why not I would like to learn salsa and then I had heard the music somehow and it was exciting and like completely different culture from the Finnish culture you know the, all this Latin culture and the rich music and all that And then I uh, met this Colombian girl who became my girlfriend. Uh, she was also she became a year later came to the school, and then I met her, and I started reading all these John Gray's dating books, and you know I have I had all the confidence, and so 
So uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. We started dating, and then she knew some of the basic steps of salsa, and that's why sometimes I give the story of uh, you know, yeah, it was I started thinking whether the wrestle with these two meter, hundred kilo guys underneath the basket. Or I see these pretty Colombian girls dancing yeah. salsa, and then you start thinking, hmm, which path should I actually take now? <laughs> Is there any similarities between basketball and salsa dancing? Well, I don't think there is much, you know, but there are, I think some people could say that in basketball, you also have to have this, some sense of rhythm in the sense that, let's say, you're doing a move and you're trying to get the person off his balance. You have to have this kind of rhythm in some moves. So in that sense, maybe, uh, of course, basketball is athletic and takes certain type of body coordination. But but I would say dance is uh, also for a lot of part to its own world. And a lot of the things that I developed in basketball, like all kind of tightness and, you know, back then even in Finland, it was kind of this proud moment when you could you know, lift so much weights that you can't walk the next day. And so a lot of the things is hindering me now. Like I have all these kind of tightness in my hip area. And now that I'm kind of more and more into this dance journey, I'm trying to like, like do a lot of work just to undo <laughs> the, the, the physiological kind of tightness I have all around my body to be able to be more flexible and so forth. So in that sense, there is not, but not, not, not much. <laughs> it's crazy how the idea of ideology of practicing it has changed a lot nowadays which yeah. is good which yeah, is very good but it was like that like oh, yeah exactly you will you will avoid <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just as stiff as possible but more strength and then you're yeah. good but it's just the opposite yeah in right? Finland we have this <laughs> yeah. saying that stiffness is power yeah and power is speed <laughs> and maybe speed is flexibility and you make the oh yeah okay so it's all start from the stiffness <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, maybe we should rethink that <laughs> But you really got into salsa because you yeah. founded some communities over there as well. Well, actually, yeah, or actually, I think I this I uh, maybe I give credit to this kind of in old. I think we have a lot of crazy people, you know. <laughs> yeah, I <think> so too. <laughs> like some people say in Finland, like if you would have to think, like where does a lot of this kind of crazy? I think Oulu is high up on the list. Yeah, I but, think so too. And in Oulu, actually, we I didn't realize, but we had an amazing Latin ballroom community in Oulu. All right. At the time when I left, it was the best in Finland. There was just happened to be this too crazy, in a good way, yeah. instructors who started developing this scene. And it became the best in Finland at that time. Like, lots of famous dancers you see here in Finland in the TV, like... Jukka and Sirpa used to teach uh, dance and train in Oulu. Hanna Kartunen, who's uh, famous all around the world as a ballroom dancer, he was in, she was in Oulu. Lots of other people you see in the Dancing with the Stars, they all practiced in Oulu. Many of them, not all. But but the point is that I also saw sometimes that maybe that got a seat that I had. But in Louisiana, the reason I'm saying this, that it's a little bit of craziness, there was no teachers. There was no dance community. There was no salsa dancers. Only salsa they knew in, in Louisiana was the dip you do in the Mexican restaurant with your tortilla. Yeah. Is they didn't know any other salsa. So I had to have this in my mind that, shit, there is no salsa. Great, I'll just build my own community. <laughs> Whereas most people, I think, would have probably say that, ah, okay, there's no salsa, too bad. But I thought that, okay, I'll just find some VHS tapes and I started looking at VHS tapes and then I started <laughs> bothering my girlfriend at the time hey can we practice this move and she's like this guy can't dance I'm <laughs> I don't I just want to dance with the party for fun I don't want to practice with you because you don't know first of all what you're doing and so then we broke up not because yeah. of that but <laughs> but anyway I found a new partner we practiced a little bit I looked up looked up some VHS cassette tapes sometimes I uh, traveled to San Francisco to also work with John Gray and then I went uh, to Dallas whenever I went to a bigger city I got some lessons and then at some points I knew just a little bit I decided okay I start a community and I started teaching just for free mm -hmm. kind of if you want to give me a donation fine if not it's okay And I found this one Mexican restaurant and I convinced the owners, telling them that let's start salsa dancing here. And they said, great, great idea. But who's going to be the teacher? I said, me, me. <laughs> Except two Mexican, little Mexicans are like, you don't know how to dance salsa. Where are you from? You know, and, uh, and they said, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? It won't cost you anything. You know, we just 
clear out this back room that you have and I, I put everything back together we start some salsa and they are like uh, all right <laughs> and then then we started salsa and then I for form it took a weeks you know but once it was something new and different in the t- city so I found some people who wanted then I got just some practice partner that I could practice more and that's I just decided that you know I want to do this <laughs> How was this resistance when people were saying like you can't dance and it sounds like was it just you giving you more strength that I want to learn this or how did you go with that? Yeah, I think well I think that that's the thing that I recommend everybody to, you know, also find books that resonate with you to give you confidence and mentors and things like that. Because at the fortunate thing was that I had already re- read books like Think and Grow Rich, which is kind of like bible for personal development and and I had I was naive enough to believe what they said in the books like you know just have self confidence and you can do it and you know you, you go for your dreams and I'm like shit I'll go for it you know so I had developed these ideas in my mind that you know if I want to do this you know I won't let anybody stop me so so that gave me strength to go on because you know they're like you can't dance show us actually they said like okay. just show us and I'm, I'm thinking in my that they actually true I don't I don't really don't know <laughs> really don't know so I just say Ah, just trust me. You know, it'll be okay. What's the worst thing that happen? You know, we do it. It won't work out. Won't cost you anything. You know, <laughs> but what's the best thing? You know, we get a lot of people. You get more clients. We have a good thing going. You get more customers. And so they liked, and we started for. Then we had it for like I don't know a couple of years, and then I went to another city, and I even during that time I taught like thousands of dancers who came through, and because after a few months there was actually. This one couple who had a dance studio, like this dance hall in the city in the center, and they came and looked at, you know, there's this salsa going on. What's going <laughs> on? You know, and they're like, "Would you come? Wanna come teach you in our studio?" I'm like, "Shit, yeah." <laughs> I didn't never think that somebody, because I wouldn't have dared to go to the studio to tell that, you know, I'm starting salsa and I teach here, because I really don't know anything. But I didn't ask for money either, and so I just like started just really for the love of the dance and wanting to actually learn myself. So. That was the intention. How strong is salsa now in Louisiana? I think Did there's. You build a foundation there. I I don't know how 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 strong of a foundation I built. I in Louisiana in general there are salsa, but uh, yeah. in that city it's quite small city. It's very small. It's like, uh, you know, smaller than Oulu. And so I think when I left, I know that in that city uh, there was couple who kept it going, and I think they. A few years ago, I talked to them that there's still something sometimes. All right. And in Shreveport, that was a bigger city. You know, that was already a little bigger than Oulu. You know, it's about two hundred thousand. I know there is it's going for sure. You know, they have had they have salsa. So, so I planted some seeds, and at least in the other city, it's it has been grown. How long did it take that people start really understanding? Because hey, this guy can actually dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. For at that time, it was. Uh, It was we just had fun and we everybody was learning. It was about the community and and uh, you know of course of course I tried to learn quickly as quickly as I could and learn as, and continuously improve my skills so that I had more offer the more to teach and so of course when I moved to San Francisco that's when I really started like more developing my 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 dance skills and such skills. I tried to find like. Uh, the best instructor I could find and the guy this one guy had moved from New York to San Francisco he was the the style that I really liked I saw that you know this guy is gonna be amazing and he had moved to San Francisco started this um, dance community there and it turned out he became a two-time world champion and so I was uh, dancing and learning with him uh, for two three years and and just like in San Francisco all that we did was like most most of the Most of the time, we were just dancing, go to the clubs, dancing, training, training our choreographies, training with him, and so. You mentioned the word fun. How important it is to have fun while you're developing yourself. Yeah, I think that's an interesting concept. Uh, you know, it's. I think it can be misleading fun. Fun, I think, can be thought of many ways. For example, I think the best, of course, is that you're really enjoying what you're doing. But you don't let it to be priority. Also, in the sense that you don't uh, kind of like fool yourself to think that you are developing and growing uh, when you have fun. I mean, <laughs> you know. So some people I think can uh, have just fun and not actually. 
be so serious about growing and developing or you can be serious about growing and developing and have fun and sometimes i think some people prioritize just like you know growing and developing even if it's at the expense of having fun and sometimes i think some people can kind of find enjoyment also the funness in actual the personal development and growth also like they enjoy just the growth and the the the, the personal development aspect and they they start to associate that kind of thing like pain you know with fun pain of growing and challenging yourself so i think there's many layers and aspects for which to look at it but i of course like in some idealistic world the ideal would be that you're enjoying yourself and having fun and then but you know being also serious about the growth and development how important is passion passion i think passion is uh super important I think I, I think it's definitely the key you know it's like <clears throat> it's just sometimes you think we are kind of brainwashed to in some ways you know to think that we should yeah like you said about that previous question that this out that you think sometimes we of course are fall in the trap to think that you know it should be all the seriousness mm. and not have fun with it and sometimes that goes with the with the passion also like like if you're serious about it you shouldn't be passionate you should be calm cool and collected and just study and do your work and do all this but but i think if you want to get closer to the things you really want in life i think passion is paramount of importance <laughs> finding what you're passionate what you really like you know that's also a hard thing to find what are you passionate about it you need to make it a study almost like for me i started mm-hmm. listing all these goals i wanted to do i tried this i tried that i tried this business i tried that that didn't work out this worked out like like this this i didn't i didn't like this i liked you know i tried so many like i don't know if probably didn't read anywhere but at the time i was doing my master's degree i was also investing in real estate i had five houses i was had a construction company and then I was doing my master's degree at the same time, and I was doing my my salsa community, and I was flying to California to, to every now and then work with John Gray, and so like I tried all these things to see what things I'm like construction and real estate. It's also very I was passionate at because I read in those books that a lot of things that unite the people who are famous and successful and have a lot of money it's like they invested in real estate or like Schwarzenegger they made their money in real estate so I was like okay I gotta get into this so the point being that you should try a lot of things mm. and then find out what really resonates because if you don't well, how do you even know what you're passionate about it seems like you were not afraid of failure well that's uh, yeah that's true that's what I learned from a lot of the good mentors through books that you know this idea and I think you in US of course in many ways there's this more of a culture that kind of kind of not I mean it's not completely there either but it's more forgiving mm. for people who fail you know there's more of this kind of personal development culture compared to Finland I think it's coming to Finland also but yes to answer your question I, I had this idea that I had learned that you know you should Failure is not it's not a failure. It's just it's just a learning experience and you learn from it. And I can tell you some funny stories how I failed in my real estate All right. business for okay, so for example, <laughs> I just started. It was the same thing at in Salsa. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I had just gone to these courses that had I invested all my money, like I think it was like thousand five hundred dollars, which was a huge sum of money for a college student, you know. Before I had invested in anything. <laughs> you know, I was just a college student, put my own money into this real estate course so what did they teach in the score course you know like this kind of ideas that you should find uh for example there's a many ways to make money in real estate but one good way is you find the ugly house and then you <laughs> remodel it and you sell it you know for a huge yeah. profit and your life is great <laughs> <laughs> so so i went around monroe finding all the ugly houses and i found one really ugly it was <laughs> it was terrible i mean i mean it's a terrible house so i found the house and then I bought it, you know, my first investment. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got a good deal. And then now I'm thinking, what do I'm supposed to do now? <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. So I just felt like I need to get going. I need to do something even at the risk of failing, you know. Uh, so so then two or three months goes by. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm still going to school. I have all these other things going. So then I go by three months and I'm thinking, oh, okay, I should, should go check out the you know, property and see what, what can be done. You know? So I go by 
And then I look at the address. There's no house. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> There's no house in there. I'm like, I drove around the block thinking I must lose my mind, right? <laughs> I rode around. I rode around the block. This is the damn address, you know. Yeah. But there's no Where's house. The Where's the house? That's all. So I'm like, whoa, shit. So then, two weeks later, I get a letter in the mail from the city. They said, hey, by the way, we demolished your house. <laughs> it was on a list to be demolished. It was so so bad shape that it was in a list for the city to be demolished. <laughs> so so the city had gone uh, and, and and destroyed the house, took all the stuff out. And by the way, here's your bill. <laughs> You're like oh, two thousand euro, two thousand dollars or something. I'm like, no way. So I get the bill. So the person who sold it, <laughs> yeah. he was smart. You know, it was this older lady. She was smart. Yeah. She sold me like, <laughs> didn't tell it's in the list to me. So what did I learn? I learned okay, next time I I buy a house, I I, I better at least check that it's in the list to me. <laughs> So I learned. Yeah, you but learned and you didn't stop. You continued. And I didn't yeah. stop. I didn't That's stop. That's a good lesson. Yeah, mm-hmm. because I was in this um, this men's group. I tell the, you know, I was in this kind of men's, men's mastermind group. I tell the story there. And there was also this one su- successful dentist who was like, so I'm sure you're never going to like invest, invest now. And I'm like, no, shit. I mean, this is like probably the worst thing that could happen like I mean what what yeah. what more terrible thing could go wrong from now from now I can like yeah. really invest with a more p- peace of mind because I'm pretty sure that nothing worse will happen so so yeah then I found a really good deal actually like two houses it was a lady lived in another city she was older she was already rich she didn't need the houses they were just going bad shape and I negotiated with a deal with her that look I will I was I don't have money to pay down <laughs> <laughs> but let's do it this way though. She finances the houses for me yeah. and uh, I negotiate a 0% interest <laughs> for the <laughs> loan and then I tell her that you know as a down payment I just start fixing up the houses like what's the worst thing that happen if I don't pay monthly you get the houses back in a better shape that's mm. the worst thing that happen so that turned out really great so then I started actually making some money already yeah. fixed up the other one put it in the rent fixed up the other one and yeah so that's uh, that was fun times though, and not so fun, man. <laughs> Raining there, I'm in mean, a Sunday, underneath the house fixing some plumbing. <laughs> but it was experience. Yeah. That's a really good, Adventure. great experience, yeah. like, I suppose, because you take it like this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. As a learning the perspe- experience, the perspective yes. in your life is so big deal. That's mm-hmm. another thing that people don't realize that, you know, you can change your kind of Tony Robbins talks about it, but in a maybe another way to understand is like how you see life affects your brain chemistry you know like if you see this as an exciting new adventure <laughs> you know dopamine serotonin you're all excited you're happy you have a good feeling as opposed to seeing it as okay my life is darn terrible miserable i'm a failure i'm never gonna try anything again then you get sick then you get sick you get bad feeling yeah exactly your brain chemistry just shuts down and you don't feel happy you feel depressed so perspective also such a big key you started meditating when you were ba- playing basketball did mm-hmm. you continue that meditation routine or was it just part of the spot being in the yeah that's a good uh, what university happened? yeah what happened i was uh, i was meditating for one year really like intensively and then then i started realizing that after one year that uh, i felt like huge changes in a way that you know i more present I had more focus I was you know more calm all these kind of benefits that associated with meditation I felt many of them and then but then I realized that you know actually you don't have to meditate every day to feel the same kind of benefit so I started meditating every other day then I started meditating maybe uh, maybe three times a week then maybe once a week maybe once a month all right Maybe not at all. <laughs> and then I went back in the rat race. So there was like some time that like um, I got back in the rat race and I forgotten about meditation. And then periodically I got back, especially on like John Gray's retreats and all this. We, we, we got back and there were certain periods of my time I got back to meditation. And then there was certain more kind of stressful periods when I didn't meditate. Like um, five, I was doing my master's degree, five houses and then... Like I'm running around fixing these problems from these rental houses and all this and like 
no time to meditate. Uh, so, but then actually, when I found this float tank, you know, it's the sensory deprivation tank, uh, maybe five years ago, and I tried the float tank for the first time as I was again like doing my different projects. I realized that, you know, for me, going to the float tank. I got in 15 minutes like such a blissful experience the mem remembrance of when I was sometimes meditating two and a half hours a day when I felt like I've gotten really deep so I got this very deep experience in so little time in the float tank and that got me the idea that oh my god this would be a life savior like to have the float tank and then that's why I started um, getting the float tank in the studio and and, 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 and meditating in the float tank and that has been such a such an amazing tool it's more profound to provide people these health benefits when you experience them yourself. What do you think? Well, I think it. Of course, you <laughs> you believe in themselves to more yourself. Uh, that's that's such a fascinating concept. This idea that you know scientific studies helps a lot for a lot of people mm -hmm. <laughs> to believe something is true. Like before, like I remember John Gray explaining about these ideas when he was nine years a celibate monk with Yoga Maharishi, who was the starter of transcendental meditation, talking about all these like amazing benefits of meditation. When there was not so many, like some say, I, I think he said that like one of the first scientific studies about meditation was actually made with his brain. You know, one of the first ones yeah. that they were studying his brain under meditation because he was a Westerner who had been like devoted his life for nine years to be a celibate monk according to him and so my point being that sometimes for many people it's like very important to get this kind of confirmation from the masses or this kind of scientific community to get the like stamp of approval before they can try something but I think there is another way that some people many times who pave the way who find something that works for themselves they also can gain a deeper kind of understanding on a personal level about whether some things work or not. And of course, I think if something has changed your life dramatically, obviously you tend to become more passionate about those kind of things. And so um, if you have seen how much it has helped you, oftentimes it gives kind of a, you, you start thinking, why wouldn't I share this with other people? Why wouldn't I want to help other people? I mean, this has helped me so much. Why wouldn't I share it with other people? And so that's where this kind of usually intention. I see that a lot of people who have touched a million, spe million people's life, like Tony Robbins, you, John Gray, you hear many successful people tell these stories, how something happened to them that changed their life dramatically, and then they wanted to share with others. And so I think, yeah, it, it, it definitely gives you this kind of, uh, helps you motivate to help other people. The book uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus affected you a lot. Yeah, and so John Gray was yeah, yeah. the writer of the book, as we know. Uh, how did you actually end up being his, his assistant? <laughs> how well, did this a, happen? That's a funny story. <laughs> so, uh, well, what happened was I was 2000, it was 2004 or 5, I had read all his books that I know of. I think he's written 26, 27 books, and I read. That, now he has a few new ones but back then I read all of them many of them like four or five times and then I read all the vi I, that time VHS <laughs> cassette tapes I, oh, I yeah, watched yeah. his videos his seminars all the audio tapes I could find on eBay I had you know f collected re listened to them over and over so I started feeling like shit I, I know this guy's philosophy quite well and so I felt like out of the all all of the different personal development authors book writers that I had read and listened to he was the one that resonated to me the most his life philosophy and so then I started looking online like how could I meet this guy actually and I had let, read Think and Grow Rich which I think maybe here Think and Grow Rich I don't know have you read it no you should read it it's like a bible of the personal development okay I won't go too much into the story but there's this Napoleon Hill who had read and sent this letter to his mentor saying that I want to come to work for you for free. And so I sent a letter to John Gray after finding out that he had just started these retreats in northern part of California. So he had started this, um, this kind of wellness and healing retreats in north part of California. But what's funny about that is kind of like, 
I was thinking, I, I need a sign. Like, can I do this? You know, like, how could I go to work for him? You know, how can I find a way? How can I find a way? And then I, uh, <laughs> I looked online that, uh, shit, he started these retreats in this small town called Fort Bragg, which is in Fort, it's in north, northern part of California in the midst of this uh, redwood forest, this big forest, beautiful place overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Well, what's specific, what's interesting about Fort Bragg is my, if I got this right, my father's, uh, my grandfather's grandfather's father from way back had moved from Finland to go to California. They settled in Fort Bragg and there is a street named after my last name, okay. which is Kempes Way. That <laughs> and was I, really your path. And I thought, hmm, okay, I just take that as a sign that maybe I'm supposed to do this. So I sent him a letter and then he, uh, you know, I'm thinking this is going to go great. I sent him a letter and he's going to welcome me. Oh, yeah, yeah, come work for me. It was great. It'll be great. And so his assistant called me a week later because I sent it like a FedEx. You know, FedEx, you send yeah. it, you have to sign it yourself to get it, <laughs> all of that. And so I was really motivated. And so his assistant called me back a week later and says that, that, uh, uh, <laughs> that you know, John appreciates, really, really, really appreciates your enthusiasm. Thank you very much. <laughs> we hope you all the best. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like shit alright didn't go that but in the letter I said plan B you know I had paid for his retreat that he had gotten so it was a three day retreat it cost like thousand five hundred dollars yeah. or something like that so anyway I say you know kind of like a like a like a backup that I anyway see you on the retreat <laughs> you know like so so then after a couple of weeks three weeks when the retreat came out I went to the retreat you know, the guy is busy, he has a million projects going on right. all the time. So after his first talk on Friday night, I tell, shake his hand and say, look at him in the eye and say, you know, I'm the guy who wrote the letter. He's, I see his eyes like, what letter, what letter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just gets 100 letters a day, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I looked him in the eye and said, you know, I want to come to work for you. And then as a salesman, and what gave me the courage is because I know his philosophy. I know mm -hmm. he would never, according to... As much as I understood his philosophy from the books and everything I studied from the man, he would not crush anybody's dream just like that. So I knew he can't just go and crush my dream. So I, I look him in the eye and say, I want to come to work for you. And then, and then he does his wizard thing. He just looks at me in the eye and says, you have bright eyes. Keep that intention. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's not <laughs> So then, of course, I, you know, I, uh, <laughs> sneaky guy. So then I, I talk to all the staff there, you know, I get good friends and I tell, I get a chance to tell them, that, look, I honestly have read all his books. I'm like a big fan. I, I, I actually have no other like, because of course, a lot of successful people, they get all kind of weird people getting all kind of intentions and all kind of business deals and all kind of things that's like questionable. And so you gotta be careful. So I understand that. So I talked to all his staff and became good friends with them and. And then they, then of course, I'm sure they had some kind of meeting at the end of the night, and and so, so they were all like, you know, super nice, and they realized that ah, this guy has actually studied this guy, because I'm sure John also gets like people, yeah, I love to love your material and read one book or something, you know, <laughs> you're great, you know. So then the next day, I remember on the on the on the on the hot bathtub, uh, he has this jacuzzi with just like this idea of oxygenated water and kind of lithium salts in there and it's like this kind of biohacking it's a biohacking center for sure so so I'm in the bath he comes to allow to check how everybody's doing and I said John have you have you thought about my, my proposal and, and he says I have not prepared my answer to you yet <laughs> All right, Joe, that was a first step forward for yeah, that yeah. conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. So then the third day comes. It's like the third day already. It's like, all right, it's now or never. So we're going into this meditation, planning to go to this, uh, practice this meditation routine in the field. And I like, he's walking and I, I go past, I, I go side him, by side him. And then, uh, you know, I said, John, I want to just let you know that, you know, I have, I have no intentions of making money. I just want to actually honestly come to learn from you. I love your philosophy. Would love to see if there's any way I could help you. And then he's like, 
okay, talk to Ellie. Ellie was the director who ran the whole thing, and then I talked to Ellie, and then I became his assistant, and then that's how it happened. But uh, what's funny about it actually is that we're talking about this because today, just today, right. morning, I woke up, I looked on my on my uh, on my Facebook, and my friend had seen John Gray somewhere. All right, and. Because, you know, he knows me and he knows I work for him. So he had decided to take a video with John Gray saying that and where John says, Nico, you know, I get all your friends from all around the world. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's nice to hear you're doing well. Keep up the good work. So he sent me a video just this morning. All right. So it's, <laughs> oh, it's what funny. a coincidence. Yeah. So it's like. So persistent way yeah. of just putting yourself in the fire. I think. I think. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, as a surfer, you know, you know, you have to put yourself in a higher wave and ride it, and yeah. sometimes you fall, and some, then you just have to get back and yeah. go back to the waves, right? That's true. <laughs> what were the best lessons you learned from John Gray? That, there are plenty of for yeah, sure. But is yeah. there something that you know is on top of the mountain? Well, I think I think this idea that I have come to think is not something he he actually talks about it, but the way I have kind of dissected for myself which is that <clears throat> there's a certain amount of things you can learn from the books and things like that so but I think a lot of people don't realize that I think the most valuable thing a good mentor can give you is something you cannot necessarily and this is gets into this esoteric kind of field but mm. but I can say it in a, explain try to explain it in a different ways which is that there is a value in some people believing in you we can, we can uh, of course, like, yes, if your parents believe in you when you're a little kid, does it have an effect on your psycholog psychology? If your parents is just sort of... <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going. So, does that have an effect on you, right? It does have an effect on your psychology. We can think of it that way. So, the best thing I remember was I was sitting in this... Um, uh, this I was sitting in his just watching again his one of his lectures and he gave this example for the audience using me so he was saying this idea that you know you see Mikko over there you know the reason he admires me so much is because that thing that he sees in me is already inside of himself so what you see in others in some ways is inside of you already why you look up to a star why you like a certain artist or a star or a business person why you like them so much is because something is inside of you already that resonates with you and i sit in the back row thinking wait a second what did he just say so the reason i admire him so is that because it's in me that seed of greatness and that and i knew how much i admired him and I knew what kind of like admiration I had himself to realize that, okay, wait a second, I have that potential. And so I think the greatest gift a mentor can give is kind of awaken your own personal potential towards to finding more of who you are in your path and so forth. And so that's something kind of invaluable, I think, that, that being around a certain people and mentors and that kind of effect can have. And there's lots of books that says about this idea you're the sum of five closest people you surround yourself with and I think part of that also has with this idea has to do with this idea that when you're around people you know they you and if they happen to believe in you you know they see the greatness in, greatness in you that awakens your innate potential more to greatness to better things to whom you are what you're meant to do so forth and I think that's something invaluable that I could not have gotten from just reading his books even. It's the presence of the mentor, as you, yeah. as you explained. And I, I can think I, of it I from... I totally from, understand that. And I can see it from my dance teachers, for example. You know, like, I see how my dance teacher says, how, how he believes in me. And, like, if you have a, this kind of coaching relationship, it's... 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 It's, um, it's very... can be very powerful. Yeah. I've seen it in sports a lot. Yeah, sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. If the coach believes in you... You will get way better, and you, yeah. you can kind of achieve better, bigger goals as an athlete. But if there's, even though you have the potential, but if the coach right. doesn't believe in you at all, yeah. it just you know drags and, you and down. And for some, it might sound like this little esoteric idea, but I think the best way to think about it: if you're a kid, mm. if you're four years old, 
and your parents doesn't believe in you, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be shit. You know, that's true. It doesn't mean that your destiny is is like set in stone. Of course, you can find mentors who believe in you later. You can find ways to uh, to to develop yourself and become great and use those even those bad childhood experiences as a motivating tool to become something to make something of yourself all of it but does it have an effect on you i think so you know and so but those are those are some that's some some idea that i have thought now other things you know the guy has such a wealth and treasure of amazing ideas so of course he's given me a good foundation for a lot of different fields and ideas and open my eyes and just um you know i think help me become a better man you experienced so many things in u.s yeah what made you come back to finland 2010 i believe you came yeah. back to finland well to be honest i was running out of money <laughs> <laughs> just dancing in some <laughs> that was one thing <laughs> and um the other thing was that that i realized that um that you know one thing was there's was, there's actually many things another thing is that i've developed different skills that I realized that I can now come to Finland to share, mm. which is new in Finland. Whereas in San Francisco, I think in many fields, they are in the cutting edge. And uh, the competition in many fields are very tough. And so, and but another thing was very interesting for me, which was I realized that actually, if I want to develop as a dancer, I felt that it was better actually for me to move to Finland, to develop as a dancer. Why? Because I knew in Finland, there's a very um, quite high level Latin ballroom scene. There's also very good Cuban, Afro-Cuban dance instructors, because in U.S. at the time Cubans couldn't go to U.S. So actually, Afro these kind of Cubans that could teach these kind of original Afro-Cuban movements in U.S. Now there's few, but back then in Finland, because Finland has had this long history of a lot of tourists going to Cuba, a lot of ladies going to Cuba, yeah. some getting a good Cuban guy coming back to Finland some some good Cuban lady coming back to Finland mm -hmm. so this is kind of um, these kind of original Afro-Cuban teachers that are good in Finland and then also for example my coach in ballroom I think he's amazing he's this one guy from Russia Sergei and he had come from St. Petersburg amazing teacher doing a really good stuff here in Finland also and turns out you know super humble in many ways he doesn't make a big deal out of himself but now he's like in very short time young guy rising to the top of the you know teaching one of the some of the top t dancers in 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 the world and so i had the pleasure and like blessing of starting with him when he was just kind of starting his school and now he turned out this guy also kind of like my salsa friend who became from kind of was not no so known yet but became a world champion mm -hmm. This guy is, in my view, already kind of also just starting humbly with like the kids he had, but raising champions, you know, like last Finnish champion, I think basically all the categories, I think except one, all his kids, all his adults won all the Finnish championships, me being yeah. also one. Maybe you have the touch of Midas. You know, the ah, <laughs> finding good mentors. Now, at some point, it's uh, then now time for me to become mentor yeah. for other people to share their, share their knowledge. And that's also what I realized in Finland, for example, these dating ideas. I just kind of been waiting for a good time to start sharing these ideas. Because when I came, my Finnish skills, like after 12 years in being US, mm. wasn't that good. And in Finland, we have all this thing that somebody can't know anything if he makes a spelling mistake, you know. And and so people are kind of critical about that. Yeah. And so also, I didn't know if it was the right time. I don't know if people seven years ago would have been open to all these ideas. But now people are like super open to these dating ideas, relationship ideas. And now also it become a lot of good success, good success here in Finland with building a lot of media, a lot of podcasts to share kind of this other side to help people. Because the idea would be just simply to share these ideas to make a better society and, and to help men and women just because there's this wedge between men and women it's kind of like there's this kind of jokingly sometimes mm -hmm. that you know yeah we know men and women are different but we kind of think this and that and there's this kind of not so much mutual understanding how we could actually we had a chance now to make better relationships better mm -hmm. kind of dating experience better than ever I think on the on the flip side so I'm sharing some of those ideas also it was natural for you to put on a 
Helsinki Salsa Academy. Yes, because we were that's teaching. All, well, that's another thing. Yeah. Is also sorry, and that's a funny story also. But oh. <laughs> but that's that's the biggest reason maybe also was I realized that I could come and take my dance skills and because in US you have this different style of salsa that really was not danced here in Finland. Although we have, like I said, hmm. a lot of good Cuban instructors, but the salsa term actually developed in New York in the seventies and. The style that they dance in US is spread around the world is the most widely danced salsa style but was not actually in Finland All right. there was Cuban dancers who was teaching the traditional Cuban dances which more accurately is casino dance that's usually danced to more accurately to timpa music but it's Cuban salsa so the salsa that comes from the US I came and that's why I started this salsa dance school we be- became a success and it's a success and we're growing it and doing the cool stuff with it and it's a passion for mine for sure and uh, that's why it was a good platform because there was a small community who wanted me to come and they, they welcomed me here and so I'm grateful and so now we I kind of been a big major player of developing whole that side of salsa community here in, in Helsinki and Finland then there's biohacker center yes how yes. did that happen Well, why biohacking and when did well, you I've actually been always, start it? Well, I've been it? always interested in the biohacking. The term is new, yeah. of course. You think the meditation part is, is biohacking as well? Yeah, well, yeah. the way I see it, biohacking is anything to do with, you know, developing your mind or mm. body, your biology, you know. Yes. You hack your biology. So, and now we have so much technology that is helping us to do it in a more... A scientific way with aura ring for example I'm waiting mm-hmm. for my new one yeah. uh, and different, mes- one too. Yeah, yeah. different measurements devices that you can use to kind of quantify to make it more objective that personal development your development of the mind and body so then that's why this kind of new term but biohacking is done for thousands of years like meditators and sportsmen and martial artists and uh, you know even you could say business people in many ways so This kind of development of the mind and body has been done. It's just a new term for these kind of ideas that kind of, in a nice way, brings many of these aspects together. You know, of course, there's been sports athletic centers just for the idea of how we can became, became a sportsman. But now we have more tools available for us. The cost of technology has gone down, so we have the ability now to bring these services more for normal people which usually it used to be only super top athletes that could use certain technology. Now it's become available for normal people to become, you could become your own life superhero in, in many ways, to do more, to have more energy, to enjoy more life. So, of course, John Gray, I view that he already had a biohacking center. There was no term, and he, I don't know if he likes the term or not, but he was doing all kind of cool experiments in 2005 already, like oxygen therapies and... Uh, like this like all kind of nutritional supplement ideas uh, different type of experiments he was doing you know taking B vitamin 12 extracted from uh, from uh, egg you know uh, yolk to extract it into a powder when you take it goes right right to your brain if you are B vitamin 12 deficient and all kind of unbelievable experiments and we were doing it also and there was these infrared saunas that had like extra oxygen bump in there okay, with different so kind of a real biohacker center then. yeah <laughs> i would say but it was like his personal it was his own private retreat so he kept it uh, i maybe i shouldn't even talk about it because it was he wanted to keep it super private all right and he just yeah. invited 20 people at a time he didn't want to make it a you know big deal he bought it with his wife <laughs> first it was just the idea to go there to vacation you know okay, with his yeah. wife but Like, you know, he has funds to explore all these things. The last 15, 20, 25 years, he's been very into biohacking, you know, health and brain especially. And then, of course, he has this angle of thinking of <clears throat> how men and women, uh, uh, you know, react to different things and what's the differences there in terms of biohacking also. But my point is that I already, of course, had the seed. I just didn't have funds or resources to develop that kind of thing so the dance school has been a platform for me to take all that money and once I have enough invest into these technologies to try to create the first biohacking center here in Finland to then bring some of these technologies available for other people and of course for me to enjoy myself that's the biggest passion and motivator for me to try to do these things too 
and the biohacking thing is, is it's not like like you, we started in the beginning I don't view myself as like this unbelievably intelligent guy but I'm trying to take more of my potential you know when I was 18 19 for many people listening to this I had not read basically single book from cover to cover you know when I went to school to university I was one of the worst high school students in my high school you know I my only reason really to go to high school was so that I knew if you want to play university basketball in the US you have to have a high school degree so that's why I went in Oulu high school you know if, if I could have gone to the US play basketball without it I probably would have done it so point being I was not that outspoken I was not so good at using language I was not so into all these kind of other ways of developing my mind and potential but now I am and my point is that the point is that wherever you are at your life whatever stage the truth is we don't know how much more you could become what could you do if you could learn your passion what could you learn what kind of adventures you could explore what kind of experiences you could have what could, how much better relationship could you potentially have how much better parent could you be how much better business could you build how much more you know good you could do to the world so that's the idea for me yeah. so are these the benefits that biohacking can actually yes yes of course like let's yeah. say you have more energy like you ask sir richard branson or you ask tony robbins how to get do those so much things so any high level athlete you know could you do those things if you didn't have lots of energy yeah. no so no so is the uh could you watching this or listening to this if you are have not really explored this world necessarily do you think it's potential could you have more en- energy potentially could you do things that potentially you could find ways to have more energy to do the more more of the things you want like one of the things i luckily got from one of my mentors is that you want to like when I was going to my master's degree I was doing my master's degree with the philosophy that I do the least amount of work as possible and I do it as focused as possible so that I have my time to do the th- things that I really am passionate about <laughs> like salsa and real estate at the time John Gray stuff all the personal development books that I was reading so I was trying to do my master's degree and I was working as a ses- assistant also to this instructor so I tried to do that as quick as I could as efficiently as I could so that I could spend time so could you do that if you don't have energy most people just have ah oh, I don't have energy to finish my MBA yeah so much time so much time yeah. I'm so tired I need to party so of course that's fine there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that and I have good time you know I travel around the world and have enjoyable experiences but if you have more energy you could just do more and my point is that not used to do more of the things you don't like, <laughs> but start making and going to the direction to find more of what you're passionate about, which is what we kind of touched on in the, in the beginning. Because I've been, why I'm blessed to do this kind of thing that I love, like dance teaching and dance school, it's my passion. I love teaching, I love dancing, I love performing. Even if I had, you know, millions and millions and millions, of, I would still do it because I love it. So you could use that extra energy that you could get from biohacking, for example extra mental focus extra mental you know when you recover that you have more energy you could use that to go toward to put to the things that to find what you're passionate about if you don't know and then once you find it put it to what that how would you start with me to get more energy what's your uh, well this is a good idea is this This is good well there are lots of different things and now we get into this complicated uh, land Mm. which is that that we are all different and I recommend everybody to everybody start experimenting some things for themselves so in the final I'm saying for the video don't necessarily like even in all my videos that I sometimes post to things that I do the truth is sometimes I don't do everything with scientifically uh, scientific ways and there can be contradiction there can be all kind of things so everything you do research for yourself trying to find out whether it works for you test it for yourself uh, if you do decide to use do something, try it because you decided to try it yourself. So, but some things that could be kind of universal would be you could try intermittent fasting, for example. Uh, that could be a good, good, cool idea for you to try. Uh, detoxing your body, like you could try, meaning that you could uh, uh, try to s- t- 
for example, drink more green powders, spirulina, chlorella, green powders, make a juice, for example. Uh, you so could nutrition wise. Nutrition wise, you could take, for example, um, but this also, I would have to ask a little bit, what, what, for example, what kind of nutritional plan do you have now? What, what do you do? No, no plan, really. Okay, no plan. <laughs> you eat every... But I, I eat this uh, spirulina, things like this. I you do? do? Some, yeah, morning shakes, but do you do there's no really planning. Do, so, you, do yeah. you do intermittent fasting, for example? No. Well, that could be a one... Tr you could try. Yeah. So, you could actually, ironically, think that, well, that won't give me energy, right? Like, it's like I eat less and... So that's something I've been experimenting now with maybe a year or two, which is that uh, intermittent fasting. So you give the digestive system a rest. And also you could try ketogenic like diet that where you sometimes are more into this ketogenic mode, depending on what kind of activity levels you have or what you do or what your goals are. But yeah. like those kind of things could be worth exploring and experimenting. So the idea there is that you train your body so for example, use fats more as a fuel source. And if your body and brain is able to use fats as a fuel source, then what it means is that you can go with a long period of time without you having to eat. Because for example, in the past, I was in this mindset that you have to eat, especially as a sportsman, if I wanna develop my muscles, I have to eat five, six small meals a day. But that, that, that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy, then it, it affects your blood sugar levels. And then if you don't get the meal, you're a little bit crumpy, your mind is not so clear. So this kind of idea, especially if you're doing more of these kind of podcasts and, and kind of work for, with the brain, you could just go longer periods of time fasting and you realize that once your body adapts to more to using the fats as an energy source, you can go long periods of time with lots of energy, lots of clarity of the mind, lots of focus. And then sometimes you could then do a, like a little bit of heal, high, uh, carbohydrates. And I think one way to think about this is that a lot of people, uh, have heard about the paleo diet for example have, yes. uh, do you have you tried that i never tried but i know that could be also yeah. some things uh you to try and then, of course there's now also all kind of tests that are super interesting that i'm still i've been um, combining this kind of seven test thing that i'm planning to do but more on that later to really like get all of this more quantified but what you could try with the the reason i'm saying this paleo diet is a lot of people are now for example thinking well that makes sense you know yeah. if we are if our biology has evolved through thousands of years, then it makes sense that maybe we are more adept to using what we found in nature back in the day, like berries and mushrooms and wild game and and fruits and all of this kind of thing. And how did it go back then? Well, if you are willing to adapt that, that may be a good idea. Then it's not so big leap to this kind of intermediate fasting idea. Because if you think, well, if you accept that you should do this because your biology is is uh, is kind of meant for it, well, how did they eat back in the Paleolithic time? Did they eat like, okay, eight o'clock, it's time for breakfast. Now it's twelve. Now time for lunch. Now it's it's closing no, six. They did not. <laughs> now now it's a dinner time. How did they eat back then? No. Well, they eat like they ate a chunk of meats and uh, then they roamed around for two days fasted and then they ate another you know killed another animal and then they eat it then they fasted again or then they was a berry season they you know for now for these one or two months they load up on carbohydrates and berries and mushrooms then they fast again and so it would make sense that maybe there could be some benefits to adapting that idea, at least playing with it. So that's something I've been yeah. uh, uh, trying. And then there's, of course, like some things that I recommend that, that I personally really, really like is these adaptogens. Like, for example, medicinal mushrooms, especially if you do some kind of um, work on a computer and, and well, anything really. Like, there's the med medicinal mushroom world is super interesting. And I feel the benefits for sure and there is already studies that people say that shows lots of the benefits uh, and so that could be interesting thing to start exploring also something help easy even if you drink, drink coffee in the morning even put it in the coffee some like there's this four sigmatic i have little not paid i don't have any affiliation <laughs> no, no commercial yeah no, i don't have any affiliation no. i just like the guys so yeah, four yeah. sigmatic for example chaga that's a chaga but chaga, then they also yeah. have this uh mushroom coffees yeah. and 
Tim Ferriss now talks about it. But these guys started in Finland. They're doing good work. Yeah. I haven't tried the mushroom diet thing, but yeah. Well, I it's do not a diet thing. It's yeah, not a, no, sorry, it's diet a is a wrong word for that. But yeah, I do actually drink coffee with fat in, yeah, in the morning, yeah. and I have these shakes. That's a cool idea. Yeah. And to be honest, I now when you put in the words, I think I've been fasting. I don't eat that much. Nowadays. Yeah, well, you might I, be I, doing like a long period of time when I eat the next next time when I feel like it, and I. I am thinking about the eating more nowadays mm-hmm. because I think what I eat because I don't want to feel that tired after eating. Right. I realize that. But yeah, but I don't have any plan. So maybe it's time to figure out the plan. For then, then, then another yeah. thing that I think is often overlooked, especially kind of, I put you in the same kind of category, like this kind of what people some say, say like this A, A type personality, which means that we're kind of like achievers in many ways do a lot of projects yeah. a lot of things that's often overlooked i think is the side of recovery you yeah. know top sports is becoming more and more important like how it's not only the intensity of the training but the intensity of the training depends on the recovery that you're doing but i think also for the more you have on your plate in a way i think it becomes more and more important to take time to recover from the stress of the work uh, like here in Finland, I think one brilliant way is to go to sauna and jump on a lake, you know, thermogenesis, it's good to kind of reset your nervous system. And and now we are finding out in science also that actually the stress is more about our nervous system than that it is in the mind. And so what I've been, that's subjectively been my experience four or five years using float tanks and using neurofeedback and using this neurosonic mattress that we have here and using infrared and using hypervive using mobility exercises using nature so that you take time the more intense stressful lifestyle you have the more you have to pay attention also to the recovery side so that you can maintain the intensity or that you can continue having energy and you can continue to have a clarity of mind and focus and so on so so I would say maybe come here, try a float tank. <laughs> yeah, I should. I'll be here. What about sleep? Well, that's what, a big thing. Is the amount of sleep or the quality of sleep? Well, I think it can be both, of course. No. You know. So now we are actually putting together this test group. We are measuring with three different devices. Uh, also, the effect on all of these different technologies that we have. And we are kind of more scientific way measuring what effect it has on the sleep. Plus also, like finding out what kind of meditation techniques and styles are the best when we try to quantify it. And so, right. but sleep, yeah, and Oura Ring is super good. Everybody should get it. Uh, I had all these other bed dip and all of these things, but Oura Ring is just tough to beat because it's so convenient. So it's this ring, for those who don't know, that just measures like the quality of sleep, measures your stress, uh, measures your cuff, kind of based on the heart rate variability mainly. And so, Yes, the quality of sleep is super important. And so, for example, I did a test a while back, realizing that even if I do certain biohacks, you know, my sleep quality was still not so good. And so now, when the new overring comes, I will plan to kind of do more tests to see also. I, I, we have a couple of friends who come to the center who also quantified uh, maybe 25 different things. So they see how it correlates. And they've done it for now six months. We are not having done a group yet but basically what he's measuring is like let's say he's trying um, like lavender oil and yeah. putting it in a diffuser or on a mattress and seeing does it have an effect on based on the aura ring measurements on the sleep quality how much sleep he has or how much deep sleep he has and then according to him to him lavender oil didn't do anything and then like find out that one of the best things according to him now from like maybe 100 data points surprisingly that correlates with deep sleep is guess what no it is taping his mouth all right yeah i've heard about yeah it. so he's taping his breathe mouth through your nose. so you have to he has to breathe his nose mm. so at the moment that's one of the best hacks that has worked for him to improve his quality of sleep and so we are now doing all these tests to like try to test like what what actually is the best like I mean there's lots of there's thousands thousands of things that you could try but like to find out what actually works and what doesn't these that's biohacking the, yeah these are the benefits of the technolo- techno- technology technology yeah. technology that you can measure yeah. yeah but 
is there a danger that people get too focused on the technology and they are really looking through a pipe and I'm just a biohacker sort of a thing that they forget about the other things well my se- my my thing my uh, my sense first of all is that we are all biohackers mm. if you drink tea if you drink coffee you're a biohacker yeah. why do you drink coffee because most people drink because they get a little boost of energy yeah. why else would you drink it is it really that good taste when you like first taste it <laughs> well for many people, of course, it's good taste. Also. Yeah, but not the first bite. Of <laughs> maybe, maybe. Honest. So not, not for me. Right I would, for I would. My <laughs> argument here is why we drink it so much in Finland, mm. the most in the world, has to do more with uh, this idea that you are changing and altering your consciousness in a way. You are altering your brain state. You are getting uh, more. So you're a biohacker. Mm. So first of all, I would say that uh, we all biohackers. So let's get over with that. Yeah. Then some there are better ways to do biohacking than better and worse ways, you know. Like, you know, the people who does quantify all of these things. Do you have to do it to be a biohacker and to get benefits for your life? No. Of course you can do it subjectively. For example, we have this lady who said the same thing. She had been trying this tape and she said, I sleep actually last night yesterday we had the conversation when we were doing all this stuff. There was this one dancer friend of ours, and she was came here to practice, and we were discussing all this. Just happened to discuss here, and she came around, and she said, "Hey, that's interesting. So, what was the best?" And she said, "Tape on your mouth has been so far." And she's like, "I knew it. I knew it." So, did you have to be a biohacker to test it with the measurements? If it worked for you, yeah, no, no. Of course, you can simply do it, and. There's even also some now articles which said that actually for some people they made some kind of study to say that if if you were constantly measuring yourself, mm-hmm. it was actually the measuring yourself all the time before and looking at the looking at your your iPhone constantly before and after the sleeping was actually making it worse. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a study or, or article that I that I pointed to a study. I didn't read the study, but that was su- just suggesting that actually this biohacking was making it worse because people were looking at this blue light maybe, you know, before yeah, and after yeah. going work and and they were getting so obsessed with it that maybe they were waking up at night and looking at it. How am I? <laughs> how am I sleeping? So. So the studies showed that that's actually made the whole sleeping quality worse because they were biohacking. Yeah. So so you have to have, uh, so, of course, both both things. Because I'm very into this idea that what it seems to be pointing at that I really like is that shit. We don't know so much about how good nature is, how good plants are. Like, I remember my girlfriend from the once we had struggles. <laughs> she loved to go to walk on a forest and I was a basketball player I thought what's the point of that you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's no point in walking in the forest that's a waste of time I'd rather just watch here what look at TV and she's like come on Mikko let's go walk in the forest it's so romantic and nice and I'm like stupid <laughs> you know <laughs> and now because we have studies to show oh plants are good for you <laughs> now we understand <laughs> they, so they, I'm like oh I go to the woods so then, right? then I have okay I need to have a, I need to have a whole, whole whole wall full of plants <laughs> over here at the, at the biohacking center yeah so the point is that of course also people have different sensitivities to things some people can taste wine mm-hmm. better if they're good taste and some are born with certain sensitivities to things so are you able to sense some things that is a benefit for you? I think definitely, of course, also. Now, can you make a, like a generalization and scientific fact about it? Maybe not. We shouldn't be. We should always, of course, be careful with generalizing that this can work for everybody. But I think almost all pioneers, in some ways, have tried something first and then figure out shit. This works, and then later they found out ah, there was something to it. Is there any advice for the timeline? How long you should try something to get the benefit or realize it's helping you out? Well, if you're like really, one yeah. week, two weeks, one day, two months, half a year, what's your? I advice? like it. This is this is the this is the male brain. Like, let's quantify it. Let's give it okay. <laughs> yeah, exact advice. Something. Well, you know, it, you can approach that question again from different directions. The best would be, of course, like if you have some things to measure it. So it's better that way. You can you can be more assured for yourself, but. Like I would also say that if something feels good, even if it's a placebo, why not do it? <laughs> you know, so. But does it feel after one night, or I was just thinking well, about it? Well, it just depends on all. Yeah. yeah, 
I, I don't I don't have a personally anything um, that's kind of that I've done for myself I said because because also I'm also of the mind that it's good to not to become like overly neurotic about those things you know so I also pursue sometimes what I feel good and for me biohacking is also this kind of hobby that I really enjoy doing and trying whereas for somebody could be like some guy could be like fixing a Mercedes motor into a sports car version or something and they just love doing it yeah do that like so if you don't like all of this stuff do you have to do all of it or do you have to try or measure no don't do it if, if it's like I think more important is also of course to, to make sure it's it is something that you feel good about you know that you enjoy it's your passion you like it but also there is this other side that also for me i wasn't so interested i became interested initially because i realized how well it affected my sport performance when i was 15 i started trying creatine tried try tried tried protein supplements and then i just tried like do i feel this is affecting my sport. Is my is my measure? Is my am I able to lift more? If not, if it's still, if it's not improving, maybe I try something different. And read more, gather more information, and then make your own conclusions. But I think everybody, in some ways, have to find what works for them in the end. Yeah. So, in conclusion, you ha- you need to feel it yourself. You need to notice yourself, not maybe some other other people telling. Well, you I this, think. This well, thing. there. Uh, use other people's advice for sure yeah. like a lot of people have given us all this data for example certain things scientifically more proven ways than others you use it you know like, like if some people have been able to prove something scientifically then definitely you should uh, that's more likely that it works for you also so use that first and then if you uh, like to explore other things you can try it without of course necessarily it being scientifically proven so but yeah that's a, that's this kind of tough question okay in the end uh, follow your heart <laughs> and, and, and many people are like no no <laughs> so um but yeah some ways for many people i think i would also recommend for for many people that it would be good to also find out and le- read literature, read what other people mm-hmm. done, what other people have proven as effective methods, and start with that. Yeah. And then if you get excited about it, then if you like those, then you can explore more. That's maybe that's maybe could be the good idea first. And then what what may happen if something works, you feel better. Then it maybe inspires you to try other things, and you don't have to start like. Uh, like if you see my kitchen and at home you know I have like spent tens of thousands of, you know I don't know probably, I don't know maybe a hundred thousand in the last five years on nutrition and different all kind of different <laughs> tinctures and like some cost crazy amount of money and some people say well there's no scientific proof you're crazy but I think we should have a freedom to explore try experiment with our own bodies if we want and some people say well those people who try things that are not scientifically proven are stupid. I think that's a stupid thought also because because I think we should have the freedom to try something and how do we not know that something is working unless we try, explore it first and then we do some studies to see whether it... And just because something has not been proven to be found doesn't mean it doesn't some level may have an effect. We may just know it. You should come here and experience your energy. It's, it's, it's amazing how it's, it's, it's just there. And I have a slogan, uh, uh, surfer of life, nothing fake. And this is nothing fake. This that's is right. real. It's you and it's your energy that's just popping out. And it, it is amazing, to that's be honest. I'm just, I'm just staring at, at some point at you like... It's, it's great. It's just amazing that Thank you, you invited me here. Yeah, I'm so happy to be yeah, here. Glad to be here. Discuss man. about these things. I have a couple more questions. Sure, for you. sure. We got a little. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. It, yeah. It's been all. It's been all very good. Uh, about yourself. Yeah. How do you deal with haters? Because of this amount of energy and the positivity yeah. you are bringing, there are haters. I read, read an article. Yeah, that's true. A blog somebody wrote about you that 
this guy is crap. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, 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 so yeah. how do you deal with haters? Ah, uh, that's good. Well, I, first of all, I don't think I'm uh, so big yet, <laughs> yet that I have many haters. <laughs> many haters, but so so at the moment, but it's a it's a it's a valid, good, super good question. In the sense that. Well, first of all, I don't think I'm so big yet that I have to worry about it so much. So I don't really feel it too much. But other thing is that you, the more you know yourself, first of all, then it's easier to to kind of kind of distinguish because sometimes haters may have valid critique also. Hmm, that's like, true. Like uh, like so, I have to. You have to consider it. And it's good to consider. Some people say, "Ah, oh, just fuck it, don't care about whatever anybody says." I think that's incorrect. So I think, like, if I'm in the dance school, I have some critique, or if I'm doing something, or I'm doing the dating. Well, in the like, for example, one guy wrote this blog post about my dating thing. But yeah. well, that was I super... read that one. Yeah. Okay, maybe. Yeah. So that was almost super easy because because clearly you could see that he had not even read my dating guide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so it was easy to say that okay. This is now he's projecting his own ideas onto me that has nothing to do with the reality of the situation because you can clearly see that he has simply guessed what I have written, which is not true at all, and so it's easy for me to say, okay, I I can you know take that critique and then to myself first think, okay, is there some valid points? No, <laughs> so so then I can say, okay, so he has not even read, read my dating guide, so. So I can, you know, just leave it aside. But the larger point, which is that, how do you deal with it? I think has to do with you have to um, have ways of also recovering, to have ways of which you have support from other people. You have to also analyze yourself. And when somebody says something, critique. It's sometimes it can be good to see and reflect. Okay, does this critique reflect something that I should actually learn from and if you feel like or if after you try to analyze it yourself you think well this I think the person is misunderstanding understanding some point that I see this differently what I'm trying to say and my intention is good then then this person I think is just misunderstanding what I'm trying to say then you can just say okay there's a misunderstanding I don't have to bother about it or if you want to correct it to him, uh, if you want to try to... Like, I think this one guy, I wrote back and said, you know, clearly you had not read even my dating guide, you know. And then it, uh, we forgot. He said, oh, okay, sorry, I will I will change my whole article. You know, I'll take it away. I said, actually, no, you know, it's good actually publicity also. I think it will just bring more interest to me, potentially. So, and then you understand, you can think of it that way. And then... Uh, then you can reflect that feedback from that person and then gain more, even more self-knowledge. And if you realize there's a misunderstanding, then it also strengthens your belief in your own thing that you can then go forward even more strongly because you have now more kind of self-awareness, more self-belief in the thing you do. And But it takes time, it takes years. And I think I'm like just now getting to the point where I'm able to like self-differentiate what somebody's saying and me analyzing should I take this personally should I use this critique is there something for me to learn is there some misunderstanding that the person and I can understand that from her or his perspective I think he's just seeing or her she's seeing this person thing completely different way and I can let it be and or sometimes you can deal with the hater sometimes not really respond to it because mm. if you see that somebody has a very strong perspective or lens about something they've already made up their mind that this is how I choose to see my world view I keep my world view and see this thing it would take maybe too much of your own energy and resource to try to make that person see something different so it's maybe better just to let it be it's, it's a very it's a great perspective Thanks. very good <laughs> yes. don't hate back just observe and yeah. Learn from it. Well, well, hating back will just fuel the fire yeah, of the haters. For sure. For sure. sure. I see. One more thing is that I think the best kind of summing up of how to think about it is that, but don't let the hating keep you from doing something that's in your heart that you really want to do. So that's I think a good summing up that 
consider it. So, but don't let somebody's negativity, which is often used, this hating, don't let somebody's negativity to do what you have wanted to do. And so sometimes I have like also, you know, like some, some hating and then I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that because some people get upset. And I have had not completely figured out this perspective that I should have. And it takes time to really find out what is it that you really believe. Because somebody, somebody can reflect something on you and it, you get frustrated, you get angry. Why? Because, hmm, maybe you didn't believe it yourself so strongly. <laughs> so it's stirring up some hate in you because maybe it's pointing out that you don't believe it yourself so. And you are getting frustrated or angry because of that. And maybe you should look at yourself first. <laughs> so there is all those different uh, aspects to it. What are your keys to success? <laughs> I think my key is to, well, that's going to be the secret mission. We're not going to talk about it, but uh, it's, okay, <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's going to be where my, all my keys are revealed completely, but strong, short version of it. I think I, my personal philosophy is that to create a better life is where we started, which is that it's good to find you what you're passionate about in your life. It's good to become more sensitive to your feelings. The, the key is not to go through life, not let life touch you. You need to allow life touch you. And you need to be open. You need to be also vulnerable to life in a smart way. To, to put yourself out there. To risk things. So that some things you fail. Some things you feel disappointment. You're going to have life give all kind of disappointments at you. And then those are opportunities for you to grow. Those are opportunities for you to find out more what you're really passionate about. What's this really important to you? What do you really want to do in life? To find out what really lights up your fire. What you really want to do in life. So that you find more what it is that you want to do. To get closer to it. And once you're in alignment, you start to feel these kind of magical things. Things like John Gray, <laughs> my friend sending me just before this podcast, reminding me of the thing and me finding my way and all of that. So you start to find your way and then it's closer to the things that you really like. And once you find those things that you really like, you start to enjoy it more. You become more passionate about it. And that itself feeds into wanting to find out even closer what it is that you like. And it becomes this more positive circle to find what you're passionate about, and then just go toward that. So, I would maybe say that in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you feel find your down? secret mission? Oh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Yeah, yeah. What makes you feel down? Down. Ah, uh, sugar. I noticed that. Like, let's say I eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar. Uh, it seems like the next day I notice often. That at night time, I start grave a little carbohydrates. And then I realize that, ah, you don't feel so, like, good. What it, it, took, I mean, it took me for years to figure that out, you know. like That, uh, like, if you get the sugar gravings um, and you get into this... But you become more aware of how everything affects everything else. And those things are hard sometimes. Like, usually you would have to start with examples. Like, have you ever noticed you eat a huge pizza... And you drink two beers and you feel a little tired afterwards. And most people can see, oh yeah, that did affect me. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. But for, but so you can uh, develop more of the sensitivity to certain things. And one thing also is alcohol. Like I come to the freaking conclusion, although I don't want to like, I enjoy red wine. I enjoy mm. sometimes a drink, you know, a little cigar. But if I drink like two drinks, I realize that the next day, especially if it's a bad quality alcohol, it, but if it's a good quality alcohol, sometimes it can be okay. But sometimes, like more than two drinks, the next day, I feel like not so, <laughs> not so, not as good. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that feels like, um, <laughs> so, so those kind of things, <laughs> you know. Also, what else? Of course, it's like. Like uh, I, but these are minor. I think I think it's more of these kind of physiological states mm. that I get into. Like um, you know, I uh, like I do my biohacking and then I go for a trip and I forget my bio. I'm so like 
so much energy. I go to this festival, we don't sleep, and then five, six days, seven days go around, and we haven't sleep at all, and we've been going and going and going, and I haven't had all my biohacking gear, we're traveling, and then I get sick, and I'm like, shit. Like, that really bumps me out, so I get sad. <laughs> or, or I invest in Bitcoin, and I'm like, shit, I make a bunch of money, and then, then I don't do a fucking good research and I take all that and invest in some stupid thing and I lose it all. <laughs> Which happened this late. And I'm like, shit, that bumped up. But that's actually even this less, you know, it's like, okay, actually, but this is good because it really put a fire in me to research more of this. It's like a whole other world. You don't even realize, like, you just have not looked into that direction much. Then you looked into it, you looked in deeper, you looked in deeper, and you're like, holy crap, what's going on in this crypto world, you know? It's like, there are now 800 like cryptocurrencies and like initial coin offerings and like whole the, where this blockchain technology can potentially go and like, so losing the money bummed me out for a few hours. Yeah. But then, then looking like, but it opened up this curiosity to this world that potentially can lead to something cool, you know? So, so those kind of things, I think. All right. You know? What makes you feel happy? <laughs> Happy Rishi tea, chocolate. Oh, good company, of course. I'm just kind of joking with a little bit this. Yeah. In Ule National TV, I was uh, interviewed about uh, biohacking, and you know, I don't like the mainstream media so much. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like a little bit fucking with them, you know. So they're, okay. they're like, they're national. It's the biggest TV. It's a morning TV. Three million people watching. Yeah, it's two million. Good that you mentioned about it. Yeah. So, so they're asking like. Um, uh, you know, so what? What's the best biohack? And I'm like, I think I think it's chocolate. And like, what the hell is it? What the hell is this? Why did we ask ask this guy? To... <laughs> and then slowly they're waiting. Okay, we have to go to commercial. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but really, really, chocolate. You know, chocolate. It's just it's just a magical substance in the sense that we don't really even understand. It's one of the only things that we cannot grow in a normal setting. It needs to have this diverse kind of jungle setting in order for it to grow. It has these uh, substances that it somehow blends, you know, blends like this taste so well that it's used by these taste testers. Chocolate is used as a substance to see like how everything, whether there's some kind of who is sensitive to taste can taste some things in the chocolate. Anyway, yeah. point being that uh, these kind of things is of course important, but then like uh, lovely company, you know, it makes me happy. Uh, salsa, like anything that can put your brain. Can be, I known this intuitively for a long time, and then I've now there is now there's scientific data is finally coming out saying that ah oh, wait away wait away. Out of all of the exercises, what would be the best for longevity? Hmm. Dance. Oh well, no wonder. Music actually. Now you can start listening to more music and good quality music because it has good effects on your brain. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured out for salsa, for example, I knew it a long time ago that if I wanna, one of the reasons I took dance as part of my kind of life goals was I realized that one of the other life goals back then was live to 120. So 120, what things could kind of like support all my goals like at the same time so that I don't have a disagreeing goals you know like I have a goal to live 120 you have a goal to you know be the best alcohol you know best binging drinker ever no yeah. that that won't support so I realized salsa is also a thing I want to do because it also helps me with this other goal that I have mm. to live a long life Indeed, so yes so so salsa for example why it makes you happy it's all these polar rhythms comes from Caribbean good for your mental there's some kind of primal rhythms from the Africa it's kind of like the heartbeat, and then this has these sophisticated melodies from the Europe, piano, saxophone, trumpets, whatever. But it also has this effect, it's one of the only places in the world where, uh, well, in our Finnish society, where the man can lead, where the woman is happy to follow. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. The lady is like happy to follow, and the, la yeah. the man, the testosterone is getting produced, if we are confident in leading, then there's this kind of like... Uh, Thing where you do it together in a social environment with your partner, with, the, with ladies, with uh, in this exciting way where you're learning to coordinate your steps and your body to these 
specific rhythms, so you coordinate the music to your body. Uh, so it has all these kind of like benefits that I see that just simply makes people happy. If you come see the salsa party, it's hard to find people who are like, no, this is so boring. Yeah. I'm not happy here. <laughs> you know. So that's what makes me happy. What else? You know, going through the passions, developing myself. Uh, you know, it's just a blissful to you know meet people like you, meet other people who are doing cool stuff. You know, being around. And then experiencing amazing things. Then I'm working on this other passion, secret mission, and and, and that's 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 just <laughs> been a been a two three year journey. We're just preparing the, for the whole thing, but it's it's fun. Uh, I think it's gonna be something big. So uh, it's it's exciting project. So doing what you're passionate, of course, makes me happy. How important it it is to stay in the present moment, as you said, like. Dancing salsa, you mm. are really focused in this precise moment, because yeah, otherwise you maybe miss a step or whatever. And yeah. now you're talking a lot about nutrition and how it is, it's affecting you and you're tasting the food, mm -hmm. you're tasting the drink. How important it is actually to be present in the yeah. specific moment. Uh, super important. I mean, of course, it's like Like let's say I'm dancing and I'm learning. The, one of the reasons I credit to learning so fast, Latin ballroom. I, you know, the, the claim you made in the beginning. I don't know exactly if it's true, but I'm pretty sure it's true that I was the yeah. first uh, Latin. Because a lot of people don't know. Okay, I dance salsa. It gives me a good foundation. But salsa is more social dancing. Latin ballroom is actually yeah. a competitive sport, and it's a different world. And uh, so in that, I in two, 2014 was my first competition, very first competition. In 2017, I went to the World Championships and went to the final. So, so I think I was the first male, male to go and from... you developed very fast. Yes, yeah. to even go to the competition kind of um, in the highest level, usually you have to go through these different categories. But I got mm. a special kind of um, permission <laughs> from my coach and because my partner was a professional dancer that we went to the first competition to the highest level directly. That's why I, I say I think I'm the first, yeah. but I'm not 100% sure. And I'm pretty sure I'm the first one that went in three years to the finals mm. in our category. That's fast. Yes, not dancing that dance at all. So, yeah. uh, or, or not competing in that dance at all. So, so even in that, when I train, I try to be as present and have my brain fac faculty as sharp as possible because it's the only way I can really intensively learn faster because I think a lot of people do things where they are not really present, they are not really focused and they are just going through the routines. Like I even see a lot of dancers who are dancing and I see them now five, four years ago when I started and I see them, look at them now and I see they are about the same place. So what are they doing? They are not like really intensively trying to improve. They are not so as focused and using their whole full potential as much as they as they could. And so whatever they, whatever you do in life, being fully, 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 more, the more fully present you can be, the better, of course. Now, having said that, I completely also understand that I sometimes often struggle being fully present. You know, it's it's it's, it's not it's not an easy thing to do. Why? Because there's so much stimulation. There's so much things pulling us to every direction. And the problem also becomes is that what a lot of these kind of, I think, spiritual teachers who talks a lot about being in the present is the best thing ever. And I agree. What they don't talk about it is that in order for you to be fully present, you have to also look at it from a, a brain chemistry point of view. And that's another reason why I think of some things like float tank, a lot of people don't talk about it from this perspective, is that when you go to the float tank, now there are some scientific studies also coming out finally to say that sleep, for example, recovers your brain in a way that we didn't understand before. But I would also already make the kind of hypothesis that float tank also recovers your brain in a way that you don't understand yet, or we don't fully understand yet. And so... My sense of it is that, for example, going there, going in a place where there are not so much sensory input and you do meditation, you can go back to recover your brain so that when you come out of it, it's you, your ability to, again, be in the presence is better. 
neurofeedback, the same thing, the, the, uh, this kind of biohacking light that I call it, which has the idea, the neurofeedback, for example. A lot of people don't talk about it from this perspective, but the idea is that if you have sensors in your brain and you measure your brain waves, we already know from measuring other people's brain waves, these people who have master meditators, that we know which level the brain waves are. So, for example, the neurofeedback idea, the way I see it, the best potential of it, is that you measure the brain waves and then you put input into the headphones to the music you're listening to, and then it's putting input, it's measuring your brain waves, and then it's trying to lead your brain waves to a more meditative state, for example. So there are these bigger companies that are called 40 years of Zen. Why? So it's the idea that you can, in a short amount of time, get the Zen master skills. So you don't have to go to 40 years or, in our case, we have the same technology that we are using. So you can train your brain to access, I would see it from perspective of accessing more of its potential. So that when you want to be present, you have the more of the potential to be present even. So because for most people, if they are stressed out, if their brain is not functioning optimally, being present sounds like a good idea, but they are not able to do it. It's hard if your brain is not functioning optimally. If you are not kind of like, for example, nourished your body so that your brain is able to, you, uh, for example, build your own serotonin, your own dopamine, your own brain chemistry. So, but I think it's super key for everything you do in life. Thank you, Mikko. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. Yeah, it was great. <laughs>